Welcome back to Your 1230, the only podcast where our guests tell their story with the help of 12 questions in just 30 minutes. I'm your host, Mike Salitro, and today we have a very, very special episode. Our guest is Christopher Salitro. He is the Executive Director of Sales and Operations at Marshawn Partners, and more importantly, he's my brother. Uh, Chris, welcome. We are very excited and thrilled that this interview is finally happening. Thank you. I'm excited to be a part of it. Excellent. Good to hear. So I'm guessing when you meet people, you probably are not going on the introduction that you're my brother. You go with the first part of that. What do you tell them you do and what exactly do you do? Yeah. So um, whenever I introduce myself to anybody, I always let them know, you know, my name is Christopher Salitro. I'm the executive director of sales and operations at Marshawn Partners. And what we do is we're a technology consulting and staffing firm. So basically any type of technology projects that a company may have, any staffing needs they may have, whether it be contract, contract to permanent, permanent, um, any of those type of engagements, uh, that's where we come into play. And it's usually centered around the technology world. Uh, we've, we've dabbled in finance, you know, accounting, administration, that type of work. But I would say technology is about 80 to 90% of the work that we do. Um, and that spans all of technology, whether it be infrastructure, application development, cloud, security, um, all of the above. And, uh, and we've helped clients as small as startups to as big as the Fortune 500s. And we just really like to get to know our clients, partner with them, figure out where their pain points are. And the thing I really enjoy about my company is that we're the perfect size where we're large enough to handle any problems that they have, but we're also small enough where we're extremely flexible. We don't have a one size fits all mold uh, we don't have a, hey, this is our only type of client we work with, and this is what we can offer. Again, we just like to figure out what the problem is and what's the best solution and go from there. Thank you. That is a very thorough explanation. The first thing I was going to ask you as a follow-up was to define the technology piece for some of us who are outside of those fields. But you did a great job there, as, as well as talking about the size of uh, your clients, as well as the solutions you provide for them. So that goes into that second thing you mentioned, the consulting piece. It seems yep. like you are their outsourced problem solver when it comes to staffing. Correct. Yeah. So it, whether it be staffing or whether it just be a project that they don't know how to handle, they don't know either how many people they need or do they want contractors? Do they want permanent? You know, we really just dig in to what is the problem? How long of a problem has this been? How long is the solution going to take to solve it? And basically what their roadmap looks like for the next couple of years, because then that can determine, OK, I actually do need a permanent hire. I can sustain them for the next few years and then see what comes up after that. Or it's, hey, we have an upgrade. We have a configuration we need to do. We're implementing something new that lends itself to, hey, let's bring on a consultant that is you know, an expert in this area. Let's get it implemented. And then from there, do we want the support and administration to be done by a whole separate person or a whole separate team that is also contractors? Or do we want it done by a permanent team because that's more ongoing ongoing work? So it's nice to just be able to offer all of these solutions and not need to pigeonhole ourselves in terms of, well, this is what we offer, so this is what I'm going to give you. I've worked at places like that before, and that's you know frustrating as a salesperson. So to be able to have that flexibility um, is key not only for us, but for the client as well. Yeah, that one size fits all very rarely works for anyone. So I'm glad you've highlighted that there. Uh, how often when your clients reach out to you, will they, I'm sure they know that something is wrong or they need something. Are they aware of what those needs are, of whether it is number of staff, if you're managing their project to know what the deliverables, deliverables would be? Is that what your experience comes in or what does that look like? I'd say about 75% of the time they know what they need. Uh, they are the experts within technology. You know, I am fairly technical, but can I code? No, I don't know how to code. Uh, I can't get into the weeds of you know exactly what needs to be done if you're creating an application. However, I know the workflows, I know the skill sets that can get the job done. Um, I have an idea of how long usually these types of projects take. So I'd say when clients come to me and they don't really know what's going on in terms of exactly what they need, it's usually, hey, Chris, I have 200 grand. We're implementing this new thing. How many people do you think it would take to get it done? And how long do you think you can, you can do it in? Um, that's where we rely on not only myself, but we have, um, consultants on staff that have been on staff for a long time in many different skill sets, and we can utilize their expertise, um, to kind of help us put those bids together, put the plan together. And sometimes we're competing against other companies to, um, see what that, 
model is going to look like, what the pricing looks like, so on and so forth. Um, but I'd say 75% of the time the client comes and they're like, Hey, this is what we need. I have budget for six months to get it done. Uh, this is the rate that we can pay you. Can you find somebody within these parameters? And we go off of that. Uh, there's more details that go involved in terms of, you know, who that right fit is. Uh, but once you have that bit of information, you can pretty much figure out everything else. Okay. And that makes sense. Uh, so seeing as that your clients are the companies in the tech space looking to either manage these projects, bring on new staff, are the the project managers or the people you're filling these roles with, are they also your clients? Do you know them already? Are you then kind of putting a requisition out to hire them? What what does, how how do you fill those needs once it's identified what what they need? Gotcha. Yeah, no, great question. So it's both. We have clients that we've worked with for years that come back to us and know us well, and it could be a requirement that we've seen before, or it could be a brand new problem. Also, we're in sales. As salespeople, you go find new clients. Um, I run our sales team, and that's one of our main things, is to make sure that we're constantly bringing in new clients, because one thing that I've learned in the staffing world, your top client this year is most likely not your top client next year, because they have all their funding this year to get all their projects and get it up and running. You take care of that for them, odds of them having that same uh, volume next year is pretty slim. So that's why you have to always continue to fill that funnel with new clients. So basically the way the workflow works is I will engage with the hiring manager or somebody on my team will engage with the hiring manager. That can be as low level as a project manager, a team lead, um, manager level, director level, and it can be as high as the CTO, the CIO, or the CEO. It just really depends on where our relationship starts Usually it's starting at the C-level or VP level, and those are usually not the people doing the hiring. So then you get introduced to their, you know, uh, people that are under them and, uh, and you just kind of talk to the organization to get input on, you know, what exactly is the problem, who's that right fit, who's the right culture fit and technology fit in terms of the skill set. I get all that information. Sometimes they'll have a requisition already written up. Sometimes they won't. Um, some of my best clients, they say, Chris, I need another Susan or whoever it is that, you know, we've already placed or Chris, I need another desktop support person. You know what our environment looks like. Go get us one. And those are usually the best ones. It, it's interesting because in the recruiting world, you want as much detail as possible because you're going to put it together a requisition. Sometimes they'll already have it. Um, you'll be posting it on LinkedIn to see if we can get people that apply, you know, we'll be cold reaching out to candidates. I wouldn't call it super cold because usually these candidates want to hear from us. They, we can see on LinkedIn if they're looking for a new job, if they're on the job boards like Monster, Career Builder, Dice, why would they be there if they didn't want calls? Um, so a lot of these times when we're reaching out to candidates, it's a warmer call and easier to handle. And really you want to qualify them not to the job, but to the person, because you want to get to know who is this candidate? What is their skill set, And not really pigeonhole them to that one requirement you're calling about because they could be good for something that comes up a week down the road. And even though they don't fit this, you want to get an idea of what their total skill set is. And the best recruiters that I've worked with, they build those relationships and they get to know those candidates. And they don't just, hey, you're not a fit for this. We'll see you later. It's okay. You're not a fit for this, but I'm going to stay in touch. We're going to keep a relationship. I'm going to give you a call, let you know what the market looks like. And then if something comes up that fits your skills, we'll get back in touch. And those people that you build a relationship with, are usually the best ones. And they also refer you to their friends, people that aren't on these job boards, people that you can't really get anywhere else. Um, so it's really a recruiting mentality to get to know the person, get to know the market that's out there, whether it be within a certain location or just nationally, especially nowadays with so many companies that are hiring remote, hiring national. Um, you really want to build your bucket of solid candidates so that you have a base to go to when you get additional requirements in a similar skill. So we find those right people, submit them to the clients, set up interviews, pick the best person, get them onboarded. They're usually our W-2 employees. Um, we also work on a corporate -corp basis as well because there's candidates that like to be their own individual corporation. Um, we have additional sponsor companies that sponsor visas. And then we work with them on a corporate -corp basis as well. So there's a lot of different models that you can work on that end when it comes to us actually employing said contractor. Uh, but in general, that's the workflow from, you know, first meeting with client to actually placing somebody. 
So I'm glad that you brought up the relationship piece because I think a lot of times, not even in just recruiting and sales, that you hit a, this is not the fit for this and people move on when they kind of overlook this could be a long-term solution for a different problem and that building a relationship is important. So I'm, I'm really glad that you highlighted that. Uh, I took down a bunch of notes because I want to ask you a lot of follow-ups because I couldn't sure. talk to you all day about this. I will not. I will stay on <laughs> point. Um, so you, we'll talk about the market definitely, but you mentioned hiring and getting to know their background what they're looking for, what you're looking for. Are there any mistakes that you see in hiring in general today that you try to avoid or that you've learned from directly? Um, yeah, there's a few things. One, looking for that absolute perfect person. Nine times out of 10, the perfect person doesn't exist. We'll get requisitions of, here's the 10 things they need to have. Let's go. Okay, great. How long has this been open? Seven months. Okay. So <laughs> have you found that perfect person in seven months? No. So let's boil it down. What are those top three things they absolutely need to have? What are those couple additional things have that, that would really put this person over the top? And what are some things that you can probably live without because someone else on the team has that skill? It's not something you're going to do for about a year or so. There's a lot of reasons why they wouldn't need certain skills. But when you first talk to a client, especially if it's your first opportunity with them, hey, here's my laundry list. Go find me that perfect person that doesn't exist. Okay, let's whittle it back. And when you're younger in this job, Okay, sure. I'll, I'll go do it. I'll go find you somebody. You don't, you, you, A, you don't want to turn it down and B, you don't want to give that pushback. However, as you've been doing this for longer and, you know, kind of know the market and know different people's skills, you can really have a more intelligent conversation with said hiring manager and just boil it down to what do you really need? We will find somebody that has that, especially, and hopefully some of these additional skills and let's get this accomplished. Um, another trap or mistake that I see clients make all the time is just taking too many, too long and having too many cooks in the kitchen. It's okay. They're going to meet with these five people. It's going to be five rounds. Uh, the interview process is going to take three to four weeks, and then we'll make a decision based off of the 30 people we talk to. That's great and all, but odds of any good candidate making it through that entire process is slim to none, and you lose really good people. My best clients will work fast. They'll get it done in no more than three rounds. And it can vary whether if it's a contract position or if it's a permanent position. If it's a permanent position, you know, we understand that you want to maybe bet them a little bit more and we get that. Um, however, the longer it takes, the more frustrated candidates get, regardless of people getting laid off, of the market maybe slightly turning. The market was so good last year. It still is good and it still is a candidate's market. So when we go to offer somebody a job, they probably have two or three other offers on the table as well. Or when they're in the interview activity, they still have a lot going on with other uh, clients that they're interviewing with. So those are usually the two biggest mistakes is waiting for that perfect person or just taking well too long, whether it be too long of an interview process or too many people that you have to talk to to get sign off on. And then you just can't make a decision and you're stuck. And then your, your requisitions go unfilled for months on end. And you're just unfortunately wasting everyone's time, including your own. So I'd say those are the two biggest things where, uh, you know, clients fall in a trap. Those are good answers. So thank you for, for that. Um, if you could, with that in mind, are there any, as you talk about through that, any war stories, any, I can't believe this happened, of course, leaving names and details out that, you, that come to mind, you're like, I can't believe I did this, or I saw this actually happen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because honestly, this happens on a week to week basis. It's you know, I'll keep it general, but, you know, I have a client right now that <clears throat> they offered the job to this person two weeks ago. I think it'll be two weeks on Thursday and they still haven't got him the offer letter. And it's like, what are we doing? Like, I understand that there's process. I understand that you have to get them in your system and you have to get the sign offs on salary and all that other stuff. But these are the type of things that absolutely kill deals because, I think we both know the recruiting and staffing industry in general doesn't have the best reputation. So when I'm constantly going to a candidate, oh no, it's okay. Your job is there. You're going to have it. They're looking at me like, you're crazy. I have no paperwork. Like, what are you talking about? And it's hard to, it's hard to be that messenger when delays are just constantly going on. You know, things may change. We may get different updates and you know, that, we try to establish as much credibility as we can as an advocate for our client. But with these type of situations that come on, you just inherently lose credibility because the expectation that was set for you, unfortunately changes. Now you have to change the expectation of the candidate. 
And now they're thinking like, okay, I've worked with other shysty staffing firms. Are you pulling a fast one on me? Did I have, did I even have this offer and stuff like that? So it's, you know, it's, it's sometimes tough to navigate those things when it's not your fault and things are constantly changing, but I've always found, you know, just be upfront, be transparent, let people know where they stand, you know, don't hold information because usually that doesn't go over very well. And it usually all comes out anyways. Um, so yeah, so, you know, I won't get into too many specifics of uh, war stories when it comes to that sort of stuff, but it unfortunately, <laughs> it happens all the time and we're constantly battling, okay, how can we solve this problem now, unforeseen and no fault of our own. Now that's that uh, you're, you're right about that. And I think your advice on being transparent, uh, keeping those lines of communication open and ideally closing those time gaps when possible uh, is probably best practices given, given the scenario that you laid out. Um, you mentioned yep. that it is still a candidate's market, which, um, you know, we hear all different types of news headlines about what's happening job in different with jobs in different sectors, different uh, you know, kind of, locations in the country. Uh, what is the current market and how are you counseling both your clients as well as the the staff that you're helping them find as far as what expectations should be, you know, besides not finding that perfect person and how these candidates can kind of put the best foot forward so they're not stuck in a, a three-week uh, wait and see? Yeah, no, good question. Um, so yeah, so the current market is very interesting. Uh, as I mentioned last year, Last year was crazy. Everybody was hiring. Everybody was bringing on permanent staff. Every, contracting always stays fairly consistent. So that was you know, still there. Um, and literally every time we'd go to offer a candidate, they would have five other offers. And that was just the reality. Now it's still good. It's just slightly different. So on the permanent side, especially within the startup world, we've seen that has decreased uh, in terms of hiring. Uh, we have some clients that literally just outsource their hiring to us when it comes to a permanent, um, when it comes to permanent hires. And that, you know, we've definitely seen a decrease on that side of the house. Uh, on the contract side, the contract side have stayed consistent because even though you hear about all these layoffs that are going on, you know, people getting rid of permanent staff, a lot of the projects and a lot of the deliverables, they're still there. So how are you going to do that? You augment with contract staff. You don't know what your next, you know, don't know what it's going to look like in six months, a year from now. So, okay, let's bring somebody on for six months, assess at that point, and then make a determination then, do we want to extend this person? Do we want to bring them on permanent or have things got worse? And do we want to lay them off? Um, it's a little bit frustrating with LinkedIn and the news because really all you hear is big tech layoff, another 10,000 gone, another 8,000 gone, 5,000 gone. And th that's obviously happening, but they don't really explain why. Last year, so many, last two years, so many companies terribly overhired. There was a war for talent and they brought on way more people than they were supposed to. A lot of these companies are obviously public. They have shareholders that they need to appease on a quarterly basis. So they make these quick decisions to, you know, whether it be increased profits or decreased costs, just to look better on paper. And that's usually when it comes to advice, it's, hey, let's continue to think long-term because yes, I understand that there is maybe some turmoil currently, um, but what we've always found is that our clients that maybe not put keep your foot all the way down on the gas, but the clients that keep their foot on the gas, you know, continue to hire in the right spots. Um, you know, don't just put a blanket freeze on everything just to pause and see what happens. Those are usually the ones that come out on top at the end of the day, you know, whether it be a year, two years from now. Um, so it's just interesting to see that. And, and the other part of it that, you know, gets to be a little frustrating is again, you see all of these headlines of everyone getting laid off. What you don't see is how quickly people are rebounding. Like, especially within the technology space, there are still tons of companies that are hiring. And it might not be the Facebooks, it might not be the Twitters, it might not be these ones that, you know, everyone wants that dream job at these big tech companies, but there are a lot of mid-size, a lot of mid-market companies um, that are that didn't have a chance to get that talent that Facebook and all of them were um, swallowing up. Now they have a shot at these people, and these people are very quickly rebounding and getting jobs maybe at companies that they hadn't heard of or just more mid-size companies that you know they hadn't worked for in the past. But that is absolutely happening. 
um, people aren't staying, especially in the technology fields. Those people are not staying on the market that long. Um, and that's the other thing is that you only hear that, you know, big tech is laying off, but they don't really specify where those layoffs are happening. There's a lot going on, whether it be, unfortunately, in the talent acquisition area. Um, you know, a lot of the people that I work with, whether it be HR, recruiters, um, those are usually the first per first people that get laid off. You know, then they look at the more, you know, marketing or unfortunately, like a lot of diversity, equity and inclusion. That was huge over the last couple of years. But as uh, you know, money gets tight. It's like, okay, where can we cut? Some of these newer programs, unfortunately, get cut. And it's like, what was the point of the last couple of years of making these changes when, you know, we're now just getting rid of it all because we need to have a little bit of a better profit. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating from our end when we see companies that act like that. However, there's plenty on the other side of it that get to reap the benefits of, you know, candidates that are willing to, you know, go to them as well. And that's usually the advice that we give to these candidates is, hey, I know you've, your track record is you worked at Twitter, you worked at Facebook, you worked, you know, Salesforce, wherever it might be. Don't just go for that big name because the big name is great. And, you know, you have plenty of snacks in the kitchen and all that stuff, but there are plenty of other things to look at. And just because you don't recognize the name of said company doesn't mean they're not doing fantastic. and doesn't mean it's not a solid career move and career pivot. Um, so there's a lot just in more in depth than just a whole bunch of people getting laid off in the tech space. You know, the tech space is still very healthy. Um, unemployment is still at a very, uh, still super low, under 3% within technology. And even in some additional sectors within technology, like security, finding security people is extremely difficult. And if anybody's laying off security folks, then they are not very intelligent because to find those are really hard. And Companies are only getting hacked more and more, and that's only going to continue, especially with the Internet of Things and devices going online. Devices are not meant to be secure. Those are super easy to hack into. So there's a lot of different areas in that capacity that, um, you know, will still be super in demand. So it's interesting when you just look at the market in general, and then you boil it down to the technology market, and then you boil it down even further to some of those more independent in, uh, in demand skill sets. That's that's a super in depth and thoughtful answer because unfortunately, a lot of us are only looking at headlines. They only see headlines. They don't a read the article or b as you point out the why behind it. Even if you do have you know the the, the facts or the numbers correct, it's like well, why is this happening? Well, it makes sense when you when you plug in the the information there. Um, I want to follow up. You mentioned having the companies that do well over a period of time, ones that keep their foot in the gas, that are not just like time, times are bad, let's get rid of staff. You know, they, they, they have that longer vision. You know, In your spot, you must know that sometimes you've got a client who may not be ideal for a certain candidate. How, how can you communicate that to a candidate if you can to say, uh, this is an opening we have, but you know, last time the market fluctuated, they get rid of all their people. So you may not want this job. Is that something that you, how do you kind of balance that from servicing your client to working with these candidates who are building that relationship, you're building that rapport for kind of a, a long, on the long term? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And honestly, that conversation happens regardless of what the market looks like, especially since we're dealing with a lot of contract openings, because we're not just calling people that are career contractors. A lot of the people we're talking to are in permanent positions. So if I'm talking to somebody that's been in a permanent position for 10 years, they're just bored. They're looking for their next role. You know, their company's not doing anything, you know, spicy from a technology perspective. And they're like, I need to leave in order to get better experience somewhere else. <clears throat> if, if I know that I'm sending, that I have a position that, you know, the client's like, hey, this might only be three months. It could go a year, it could be two years. But odds are it's likely three to six months. I'm going to advise that person. I know this is a good move when it comes to you getting exposure to this technology. However, it's probably not the right move for you. You're in a permanent position. You have a family. You said you need benefits. Uh, granted, we offer benefits, but still, it probably doesn't compare to someone that's been 10 years at a you know, certain company. Um, we like to just figure out what is, what is the person's drivers. And if that person is like, hey, I'm set. I, I've, I've saved. If this ends in three months, okay, I'll just go find something else. I know my skill sets in demand. You have to have that back and forth conversation because you need to understand, you know, what is important to this, what is important to this candidate? Is it money? Is it the opportunity to work with certain technologies? Is it the opportunity to work in a certain industry or with a certain client? 
Um, all that really depends. And that's when you really understand when to push, when not to push, when to advise them to go somewhere, when to advise them not to go somewhere. It's really just digging down to the candidate. And again, that comes with the relationship model. If you're doing things transactionally, you probably don't even care. You're just like, okay, great. You, you fit. Let's send you and see what happens. Oh, you got cut three months from now. Okay. Sorry. That's, that's what happens when it comes to contracting. It's a, it's a chance. Again, there are, the industry can have a bad rep because there are companies and ones that do that. However, when you actually take the time to get to know people, to figure out what is their drivers, what are they really looking for, then you know how to make the right match. You know, you know how to share the information that is relevant to them and that you know that they want to know. And then you go from there in terms of what makes sense. Should we go for this job? Should we not go for this job? So it's really dependent on the person. That's that's really helpful to hear you say that because as you talk about being transparent, having uh, the ability to w keep an eye on the long term and run a company that's based on relationships, you know, that answer really embodies that, you know, we can't just put people in roles and then hope, hope it works for the best. We need to be upfront on both ends. And I think that's, that's a fantastic way to kind of describe that. Say, look, somehow we're already at time. I've got two questions I need to ask you. So I'm going to get them in. Uh, feel free to answer them as you see fit. The first, uh, you mentioned, you know, working with startups in the tech space and you kind of joke about the snacks in the, uh, in the kitchen that, you know, the perks we read about. What are good startups or startups that are pushing past that level and becoming viable companies? What do they have in common or what are you seeing ingredients for a company that starts there and, and makes it? I'd say for the first word that came to mind was flexible. Um, you, there's, there's, there's a lot of companies that are super rigid that are just like, hey, we need these guys on site five days a week. No questions asked. Great. Your positions are probably not going to get filled, especially within technology. Like to the, this last two and a half, three years, have been a case study of how productive you can be at home. And especially within the technology world, um, I do understand that there is innovation, team meetings, that camaraderie that is lost when you are remote. However, there are ways to do it where you still, where you still have that. It, you, know, you, can, you can require two days a week on site, or you can require, hey, we're gonna do, you're gonna be a remote person, but once a month, we're going to come on site and have three days and we're going to do that. Or, you know, however you integrate on uh, like this with, uh, with virtual type meetings, like some virtual meetings are, you know, they, they get, um, they get overwhelming and people don't want to do them. However, you can do them in a right way at a right frequency that just makes people feel like they're a part of something as opposed to just being at home doing nothing. Um, so I would say the ones that are flexible in terms of what their arrangement is in terms of, do I have to come on site? Do I not come on site? You know, how often are we meeting virtually? Um, what are these meetings about? Is it, you know, you always hear the same, this could have been an email and there's plenty of companies that do all meetings when this just could have been an email. Um, so it's really just finding that right balance of creating a solid experience for employees. Um, because especially when you're going through an in-depth uh, interview process, these people probably know what they're doing. Um, they've had, they will have other opportunities that are full remote. Um, and you just have to understand that the only way to build a solid team is to be flexible, offer what is interesting to that person. There are some people that love to go on site and they want to be on site. So I'm not telling clients to get rid of your office space. Like absolutely not. Um, just have it available and be flexible for that right person. Figure out what works. are you and what are your must-haves and what can we you know what can be we be a little bit more flexible on um, beyond that people like to work with the latest and greatest technology people like to work with you know stuff that might hit the hit the market and then be like yeah you know i created that um, i know we're coming tight on time but i always i always tell the story of literally my first client was motorola motorola was the first one that i was ever working with and every meeting i went on they were like oh, this is so awesome. We're working on this new three screen technology. Soon you're going to be able to watch TV on your phone, on your computer and on your TV. Just wait till it comes out. And I was like, oh man, that's going to be great. And then we actually place developers and then it actually comes out. And it's just really cool to see that 
hey, you know, certain developer, you were part of making this and now everybody use this. And it's, you know, those little things people find exciting. And, you know, at the time they were using cutting edge technology and working on something that everyone was going to see. And uh, yeah, so beyond the flexibility, also having something exciting that, uh, that can really, you know, get people up in the morning. Those are both both good things to have. We paint that you paint that picture well. Second question. Second question. Let's be a little quicker here, if you can. Sorry. For the candidates that no, don't worry. For the candidates on the other side of the equation, what can they do to put their best foot forward? What things should they have? Are cover letters still important? Should they have their own website if they're in technology? What things are you looking for that kind of separates the best from uh, an average candidate? Um, cover letters, I don't feel like are as important. Um, I could be wrong there. That could be my bias, but I've never been a fan of cover letters, nor have I ever needed them when working with clients. Um, and that's because we do represent our people and we give our own little blurb of why this person is a fit. So I think just really, if you're working with a recruiter, really highlighting your strengths and your accomplishments, um, and then, you know, teaming with them on how to really highlight those based off of what the need is, um, that really does go a long way. Um, don't be jumpy. It's, you know, if, if, if candidates are having, you know, six months here, three months here, a year here, uh, be aware of that. And if you're aware of that, then, okay, my next role, maybe it should be a permanent role, or maybe it should be a longer term contract. I have to show stability because that, that is feedback that I do get for a lot of candidates. Even if it is just a contract job, that's six months. It's like, oh, this person's too too jumpy. They've worked only six months everywhere else. Like, well, your job six months as well. So, you know, <laughs> these are the type of jobs that they've got. So it's kind of that back and forth. But being able to show some type of longevity at a company um, definitely goes a long way. Um, and just really being able to connect on an interview. Uh, a lot of people in IT are introverted, you know, are quiet. Um, you know, they're not the best at selling themselves. And, you know, we have to coach them in terms of, hey, you're really soft-spoken. And you give short answers. Let's work on that. You know, practice talking on. You know, leave yourself a message. Do a video of yourself. Hear yourself talk. You'll you're gonna find that you're hard to understand. And even though you're a fantastic candidate, look great on paper. If you can't connect with somebody in that interview, they're not gonna hire you because unfortunately that goes way longer than you know my resume look good. So um, you know, being able to take that feedback, implement it, uh, definitely helps job seekers. Those are a good piece of advice. Uh, we have covered, I feel like, a good amount of ground today. Is there anything, Chris, I didn't ask you that I probably should have? Um, no. I mean, I just, uh, the, the one thing that I do say when it comes to the staffing and consulting um, industry is I always call it a gift and a curse um, because there's a lot of us out there and a lot of them do the job very poorly. And it's very frustrating because when you first reach out to somebody, and they're only used to someone that's very transactional, that treats you like a piece of paper. That's how they treat you at first. So it's really tough because, you know, you get placed in that bucket as soon as you reach out to someone. However, it's a gift because you can very quickly differentiate yourself and very quickly show, yes, I know this is how you're used to being treated when it comes to working with a recruiter or whatnot, but that's not the experience that we're going to give you. We want to really understand you. And, you know, we have your interest at heart. It's not just about, oh, I need to close this deal next, next, next. Like, yes, there's always that aspect of it when it comes to any type of sales role. However, we are in the people business. So you'd be amazed of if you just treat a person like a person and actually care a little bit about them, you are differentiating yourself so much compared to all of your competition. Um, and then those little things do say, you know, do what you say you're going to do, follow up with people, be transparent. It's, it, it is a gift because unfortunately not many companies are doing that. So when we do, it goes a long way and, and candidates appreciate it and I mean, clients yeah, as well. I feel like your entire interview discussed things that really talk about treating people well and understanding that this is a people business, not a sales business. So I'm glad that that's a great place to end. Uh, and I, I mean, I talk to folks all the time that are unfortunately are in roles that are viewed as commodities, you know, sales, recruiting, real estate, but you're so right when you call it the gifts, because it's so easy to get over that low bar that the competition has put out there that when you do exactly. it's like, wow, this person actually cares. They know what they're doing. So yep. I, I love that's where you decided to end it. Uh, Chris, if anybody wants to reach out to you, find out more about Marshad Partners, where can they do that? 
Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, again, my name is Christopher Salitro. Uh, my email address is just my first initial last name, csalitro at marshawnpartners.com. And our website is marshawnpartners.com as well. Um, and we have an inquiries area. So if anybody needs any type of staffing or project or just technology advice in general, you know, feel free to reach out to us there or to myself directly, and we'd be more than happy to help. Thank you so much. We will post those links. Chris, you were, if not my first invite, certainly one of my first three. We are nearing episode 150. So thank you for being one of the hardest uh, interview <laughs> interviews to recruit. But this was great. Thank you for doing it. You're welcome. I like to keep you on your toes. <laughs> well done.